send you the recording after the talk. Okay. Yeah. Very good, Saipra. Thank you for the time. Yeah, very hard because everybody is so busy. They are working uh, almost uh, 9 to 12 hours every day. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Research yeah. is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And that too, now they're sending more papers to review, more than usual. Yeah, yeah. now uh, every New York reviewer has like 10 or 8 papers to review. Yeah. Keeps on increasing. Good, good. So we have uh, students also. Shambhavi is uh, the student who emailed you. Shambhavi, yeah, yeah, please introduce yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, this is our first talk. I'm Shambhavi. And uh, I look forward to a career in research and I thought why not to start something which Good. can uh, encourage people reading research paper on a weekly basis and we can discuss our doubts because generally when we are going through a research paper there are so many mathematical aspects which we tend to skip because we don't understand them and if uh, people can go through a paper in depth, then th definitely it would give them an opportunity to know about the state of the art things. For example, uh, I was going through a paper and uh, I have generally just used hyperparameter optimization usually. And I do look forward to implement your suggested data augmentation method into my further methodologies of computer vision. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, good. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So today we have two great speakers, and we'll be they'll be talking Aisha and Isham. They'll be talking about learning data augmentation with a bi-level optimization for image search. Please go ahead, Aisha. Please go ahead. All right. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting us. It's a pleasure for us to to help you to start this this series of talk and we are happy to help the community. So today we are gonna present a work that we did recently with Isam called Learning Data Augmentation with Bilevel Optimization and for image classification. So it might sound a bit scary, but we will explain uh, what it means. So just a few words on the team. So this is a work done jointly with Isam at Element AI and we did that with uh, my three supervisors. Ismail Ben Ayed and Marco Petrazoli at ETS Montreal. For those who don't know uh, what is ETS, so this is uh, part of the University of Quebec. So the, there's not university in the name, so it's a bit confusing, but it's part of University of Quebec. And also, yeah, we were supervised by David Vasquez at Element AI. So just a few words to introduce our work. So. What we are doing in this work, so the research task, is image classification. So the goal is to train a model that, uh, when presented an image without a label, this model will try to predict the class the image belongs to. So in this example, we have an image of a cat that we fit to the model, and the model has to say, okay, I can see that there's a cat on this picture. Today, for this task, the best results are obtained using uh, networks called CNNs, Convolutional Neural Networks. And the problem with those networks is that they require a large amount of uh, label training data to be trained. And the problem in, is in real life, it's uh, most of the time super difficult to get access to a large amount of uh, annotated uh, data because for different reasons actually. So it can be simply too uh, expensive to get the annotations, or sometimes it can be almost impossible to get the data, so the labels. For example, if you need a special equipment that is not available, or if you need to uh, classify a very rare object, sometimes you don't have an example of this object, so you, need, you have only one or two labels and you need to, to classify. There are uh, many ways to to improve the performance of the model, even in those conditions. So when you have only um, a limited amount of label, and one of them is uh, data augmentation. In the context of uh, data augmentation, uh, image classification, data augmentation consists in the following: 
starting from an image, we create new images by applying different transformations that are class preserving. We can see here on this slide that we take an image of a cat and we apply different transformations like rotations, flipping, or slightly changing the colors and uh, the cat remains a cat. So we still get uh, cat's images. Oh, I didn't say at the beginning, but uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me if I'm speaking too fast or if something is not clear. Yes. I think that... I will be checking the chat. If anything, I'll interrupt you. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay, yeah. Because I know that there is some time plan at the, at the end for the questions, but if you have some questions in the middle, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, we can. All right. So that augmentation, yeah, the problem with that augmentation uh, is that, yeah, first, it's data set dependent. So for each data set, there are some, uh, some transformations that are more useful than others. Like for the cats, we could see that if we apply rotations or flips or minor color transformation, the cats remain cats. But here, if you take, for example, some numbers like the six, if we apply a minor rotation, then the six is still a six. But if we rotate a bit too much, then it becomes a nine. And this can confuse the classifier. And if you apply a flip, it will create a character that is not a number. So you create uh, a character that is out of distribution. And this is also something that we don't want. So we see that we cannot always transfer uh, transformation that are good for data set to another. And also, um, the data augmentation require expert knowledge or prior knowledge because for um, natural images or for the numbers, as human, we can guess more or less which transformation can be useful to train the classifier. Like rotations, we, we think that it's okay. Flip can be okay in some cases. But in some, uh, in some fields, like in the medical imaging, it's a bit harder. Like here we have an image extracted from um, a breast cancer imaging data set where you have to detect uh, the tumors and classify the tumors. And uh, if you're not a medical doctor, it's quite hard to define the, the best transformation. Like if we apply rotation, is it still, is it still okay? Is it still biologi biologically plausible? If you change the colors, is it still okay? So we need to find a way to, uh, to define the transformations with less expert knowledge. So just to sum up the research problem that we try to tackle in, in this work. So for a given data set, how can we define the best data augmentation transformation to train our classifier, image classifier? And uh, how can we define the best parameters for those transformation? Like if we find that rotation is good, which angle, for example. So to make it easier for you to understand our approach, I will start with the most uh, standard thing that people are doing when using that augmentation to train a classifier. So what people are doing in practice is grid search. So grid search is quite simple. So you have here your classifier and you have your training data set. And you have a predefined list of transformation like rotation, scale, usually flip, uh, color transformation like saturation, U, uh, and so on, brightness. And for each uh, mini batch, you select uh, some transformation randomly. You apply those transformations to the training uh, data to get, augmented, uh, to get augmented images, and you use uh, those augmented images to train the classifier, and then get the training loss, you update your weights, and then you iterate that until convergence, until the classifier is trained. And at the end of the training, you assess the performance of the classifier with a validation set, and you calculate the validation accuracy. And then you repeat the sequence, and each time you select a different transformation from your predefined list. And at the end, when you tried all the combinations, you take the augmentation parameters that give you the best validation accuracy, and this is the, your best set. The problem with this approach, so yeah, there are, there are several issues to this approach. 
The first one is that you have to choose which transformation you want to try and which trends of values you want to try. And as we saw earlier, it's a bit difficult. In some cases, it's difficult to define the transformations. And the second problem is uh, the training speed, because you see that you have two steps in the training. The first step that you alternate, the first step is that you have to train the classifier till convergence with a set of transformation, and then you have to assess the validation to measure the validation accuracy. And this can take a long time. Like if you think like a data set like ImageNet, where it can take a few hours, a few days to train the classifier once, and you have to repeat that many times for each set of transformation, it can take a long time. And if you don't have a lot of GPUs, it's very hard and frustrating for researchers as well, but <laughs> another topic. Um, so to address those, those two issues, we propose several solutions in our approach. So first, to solve the problem of the transformation selection, we introduce an augmented network, augmentation network here with parameters theta. This uh, network will learn uh, which transformation are the best for this particular, particular time of the training and the best uh, values for the, for, the, for the transformation. So this allows us to get rid of the manual selection because here, instead of saying, okay, choose between a list of transformation, we say, okay, learn, uh, learn uh, a fine transformation, for example. So we define here a kind of superset. So instead of selecting each transformation individually, we learn the, the parameters of a superset. And for the colors, we also learn the parameters of, of, uh, of the different transformations. So this is to get rid of the manual selection. Then to get rid of the two-step approach, we use the validation loss here. Here we train again. At the end, we use the and we calculate the gradient and the validation loss to update the parameters. Here also the difference with the grid search is that we introduce here noise vector that we draw randomly also from a normal distribution. This is because we want to learn a distribution of transformations for each image and not only one transformation. So you introduce even more uh, data augmentation. So with those two uh, solutions, we get rid of the manual selection and we make the training a bit faster because uh, we reduce the two steps into one. But we still have the problem that we have to train the classifier till convergence, and this can take time. And also we introduce a new problem because we need to be able to backpropagate the gradient of the validation still the augmentation end. We have to save all the steps here to be able to, to use the chain rules, so not to break the chain rules. And by doing this, you increase the amount of memory that you need to have in, on your system to save all the steps. Does uh, the number of images play a role in the time spent? Number of images augmented. If you have 10, uh, if you need 10 uh, images or 20 images, does that uh, matter for the time? Do you mean the size of the data set? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or the batch size? Batch size, batch size. Um, so in terms of augmentations, so in terms of performance is uh, from our experiments, we try to introduce more augmentations, like instead of having one transformation for images, we introduce three. We didn't see a lot of improvement, so it was very marginal. So we kept the number of augmentation to one. Okay. And then for the batch size, yes, if you, it depends on your system. If you have a system with a lot of memory, you can increase your batch size and just your training will be faster. Okay. By memory, you mean cores or RAM? Number of cores or RAM? Can you say that again? By memory, oh, number of cores. Cores. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we try different number of cores. 
So it's, it's helping a bit at the beginning for the data loader. But uh, for us, the limiting point was the memory on the GPU to, to, do, the, to, to do the training and also to save the steps. Right. So increasing the number of cores was helping a bit, but only for the, for the data loader. Right. So the, yeah, the limiting point, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, I would say it's standard, it's the GPU memory. All right, any other questions? Uh, no, if any other, I'll interrupt you. Okay. okay. All right. So, okay, back to the model. So we solved the problem of the selection and the two steps, and now we have a problem with the speed and uh, with the memory. So to solve this, we are using something called truncative backpropagation. This is something that is also used to train uh, recursive neural networks. And uh, it works like this. So instead of using the, the perfect gradient of the validation loss, we uh, calculate an estimate. And to do this, we, instead of training the classifier till convergence, we train it only for a limited number of epochs. And when we do the back propagation, well, when we do the unrolling of, uh, the, of the training to come back to the, to the start of the training, we take we consider only a limited number of uh, of epochs. So we train a limited number of epochs, and we unroll only a limited number of epochs. So the, by doing this, so you get a validation loss that's not perfect, but we get an estimation that is good enough to train the augmenter. And by doing this, you limit the memory required, and you only add a minor uh, overhead to the training. Okay, so a summary of uh, what we propose in our model to, to do the augmentation. So first, we introduce an augmented network to learn the augmentations. So this helps us to avoid- My prof, there's a question. Yeah. How do the shared yeah. weights help? Oh. Oh, can you say that again? <laughs> uh, it is a question from the audience. Uh, she asked, how do the shared weights help? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I skipped this part because it was a bit difficult. It's the bi-level optimization part, but I will try to explain it uh, easily. So uh, here you can see that uh, when you do that, that augmentation, you apply the, the transformation on the training images and you turn the classifier but you don't apply them on the validation set because here you want to uh, learn to teach invariances to the model that will appear to the in, the, in the in the test set. If you apply the augmentation here, it will be like um, the special transformer and it won't learn uh, to do that augmentation, but it will learn to do, um, to do uh, alignment image alignment. And the problem is when you do that, you cannot back propagate directly. Well, if you had the augmentation network here, at the end of the training, you could back propagate directly the gradient and the validation loss to the augmenter. But here, as you don't have the augmentation network in the validation phase, but in the augmenter network, you need to find a way to keep the, the the whole chain, not to break the chain rule. And this is why we use the chair weight. Um, it's a bit tricky. I don't know if it was clear. Well, if I might step in, is it because, so now we have two parameters, right? The theta and the omega, right? Omega is for the classifier, and the theta is the augmentation. And the idea in bi-level optimization is that you freeze one and you update the other, right? Yes. So, so you freeze the omega, which is the classification network, uh, which is in the blue region. You freeze it, so you use the, you have to use the same classifier because that's the one you're training, and that's omega. You freeze it, and then you train theta, and then you train theta and freeze uh, omega. Like, and you do that interchangeably, right? Correct. Yeah. Maybe it's clearer this way. 
Yeah, it's clear now. All right. Thank you, Isam. <laughs> Okay, so the first um, solution proposed was the augmenter network. Then to be able to train the network end to end, so to avoid the second step, we use the gradient of the validation loss. And finally, to uh, make the training a bit faster and limit the amount of memory needed for the training, we use truncated bad propagation to calculate an estimation of the gradient and validation loss. Only you a few gradient descent step and not the whole the whole chain all right so now we will show you some results and i will leave the stage to isam here i will stop sharing right uh sure yeah, yeah i'll uh, i can i can share the screen yeah, yeah yeah thanks um okay yeah please go ahead isam i think uh, yeah uh, everyone, please post your questions in the chat. It will be great. Uh, okay, thank you. I can see the screen? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Uh, so these are some results. I'm going to show you three three different results on three standard data sets. So the first one is the CIFAR 10 results. So the CIFAR 10 is one of the standard classification data sets. Um, what we did here, uh, so among other results, so these are the two main ones. We wanna, so what we want to compare is this. So this is our model with the classifier plus the augmentation. This is the whole inner loop, outer loop, bi-level optimization method. And if you consider only the classifier, so the baseline would be just the classifier, and that would be just the blue region. So if, if you just train the blue region, Instead of validation loss, now it's the training loss. If you train only the blue region, that would be the classifier only. If you train the whole thing, that would be ours. So if you just train the classifier in the CIFAR 10 uh, data set, you would get around 90% accuracy. If you train it with the augmentation network, uh, you'll get 94%. Yeah. Uh, just one second. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in CIFAR 10, we achieved four points extra by adding the augmentation network using the bi level optimization. And it was a state of the art among uh, other methods as well, compared to like uh, similar methods. Uh, and these are some of the qualitative results. So usually in the CIFAR 10, people use uh, crops and rotations, but our augmentation network was able to learn other types of augmentations, such as shearing sharing with scaling, uh, cropping, all of them combined and so on. So this is what makes the augmentation network uh, powerful is because you can learn other kinds of augmentations that uh, the standard augmentations don't cover, like just rotations and crops. You learn other types. So this was CIFAR 10. In the ImageNet also, we achieved uh, improved results. So if you just use the classifier only and you train it, you get 69%, this is uh, the top one accuracy. And ours achieves uh, around uh, 76% accuracy. And these are some of the uh, augmentations on uh, uh, ImageNet images. So you can see there's a lot of variations here. Uh, a lot of cropping, shearing, and rotations, and so on combined. Uh, so these are two of the main uh, standard data sets for classification. But we also considered another data set uh, for medical imaging. And what we realized is that for medical imaging, uh, data augmentation is very, uh, it's very, very useful, especially because a lot of the times the data sets are super small and you have augmentation, it can help a lot. Also, you need domain expertise to make sure that your augmentation is correct. Um, so in this data set, uh, so th we were doing a, a breast cancer classification. So we have images of uh, breast, um, and the, uh, and that would be the image, and then you feed that to classifier and it tells you whether there's cancer or not. And using this, just the classifier only, we achieved a, an accuracy of uh, 49%. However, with the uh, augmentation network, we achieved an accuracy of 56%. So that's seven points extra. Uh, these are all nice motivation for using this method. Um, 
So now uh, we're going to do some live coding just to show you highlights of uh, how to use our code, how to use the repo. Uh, yeah, there is one question from yeah. Priyanku. Uh, did you use the augmented data for training the normal classifier, which had accuracy of 90%? That is the question. Um, we did, comp uh, I think Cypher can answer that question. Yeah, oh yes, sorry, I, I thought I was mute, but actually not, I can answer. So the 90% are without augmentation. And if you go to the paper, you can see the numbers because we, we uh, the idea was to avoid the manual selection. So we mm -hmm. compared also our method to predefined transformation. And for all the data sets, we are above. Uh, so these are all the results. So this is the baseline classifier only. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure why it's not showing 90, but it should be. Uh, but these are with the different uh, transformations. So the, with a different transformation, you achieve around 94. But if you just do the model, you can achieve that without any of these uh, transformations. Got yeah. it. Got it. I, I, yeah. So I, what we did. Yeah. Oh. So what we did is to train a classifier without augmentation to see the model without anything, and then we train with uh, the best augmentation that we found in the literature, and then we mm -hmm. trained our model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so these transformations are the best, like the state-of-the-art transformation in the literature. So people had to come up with papers and research to, to find these transformations. While in okay. our case, uh, it just automatically learns that. So, Understood. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so the idea is not to really improve over them, the idea is to at least teach uh, their values without domain expertise. Yeah. Uh, Priyansh, I hope it answers your question. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead with the live coding. Okay. It's going to be uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I prepared a Jupyter uh, notebook. Very and good. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. So, um, so this is their main uh, rep uh, repository. So maybe I can just put that in the chat. Uh, yeah, please use the repository. Uh, Isam will post it in the chat. Uh, do, you, do you see the chat window? No, so I'm going to send it to Cypra so okay. he can put it uh, He can put it in the chat. Cypra, can you put it in the chat? Because <laughs> I yeah. guess when I share the screen, it doesn't find it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I will put it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll go through some of the highlights here. Yeah, yeah. To Please zoom in a bit. I think, yeah, you can just zoom in a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Better? Yes, okay. better. So we're going to show some highlights. Uh, like we will show how to visualize some results, define experiment configurations, load data set, train and test, and train large scale experiments if you want to reproduce all the results. So. We, so f first, uh, to give you highlights of the visualization, so we have this Haven library. That, so if you just install the requirements in the repo, we will have this Haven library. This allows you to visualize the results with a dashboard. So for example, here, this uh, gives you widgets like this. So this loads our results, which we have trained. Mm -hmm. So you can say, so here we're filtering based on the data set, let's say CFR 10 and the network there's an 18 meta. And here we can see this is the experiment ID and this is the higher parameters and the metrics and so on. And then we can see the plots as well. So this is the bar plot that we showed earlier. So if you just do display plots and then you get for the orange one, this is ours where we use the classifier plus the augmentation network, small affine. So the, our augmentation network here is called small affine because there are different variations of what the augmenter could be. And the classifier only, which has no augmentation network, it got this result. And also if you type line here, then that it can show you the line. So yeah, so this is interesting. So this is, uh, yeah. huh? Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. This dashboard, yeah, very good to visualize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good, thank good. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, the, the blue line is the classifier only. So we did uh, some uh, babysitting with the learning rate. So every few, uh, every like a set number of epochs, we reduce the learning rate. So as you can see here, so the uh, x-axis is the epoch, 
at the y-axis the test accuracy so as you go along so here there's the drop in learning rate so it first converges drop in learning rate goes up and then it went up here again but then just converged here ours you see ours is very crazy because yeah, yeah, yeah. augmentation network is trying a lot of different augmentations like crazy augmentations it just goes crazy 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 and then it goes up a bit or when the learning rate decreases, it goes crazy, crazy and then it starts converging. So, uh, so it's very interesting. So the, yeah, yeah. Going to, yeah. So if you see this kind of variations, uh, like you don't have to worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this is the, uh, one of the main highlights for how to visualize uh, with the, the results. Uh, now I'm going to show you like training and testing. Okay. So this is just imports. They can ignore this. Okay, so first we can define experiment configuration. So each experiment is defined as a Python dictionary like this. Um, so where you have the batch, the batch size, the data set, where we define the transform level, the val transform, color, data set size, uh, seed, we chose just the random one. Uh, so here's the model. So the model contains of two things. It contains for net A is the augmentation network, and net C, which is a classifier. So this one is without the augmentation network, so it's none. And this is the classifier, so we use ResNet 18. But the ResNet 18 here, uh, it's wrapped with uh, Torch Meta. So Torch Meta is library, and we need mm. that, because that's okay. the way we can do bi-level optimization. Okay. okay. Yeah. Like meta learning. Uh, so this is when if the augmentation network equals none. If we put uh, if we define an augmentation network like this one, this is the augment augmentation network, the one that does augmentation, and then we get the experiment configuration within that uh, augmentation network. Um, okay, so let's say this is our uh, experiment uh, dictionary. So this is the high parameters of this experiment. Now let's load the data set. So we have this function called get data set and just feed it the experiment dictionary, and then you can get the train set or the test set. Um, so we load the training set and the test set, and then we show some example images. Okay, so uh, they look, they don't, they, don't, they don't look very well because this is C510. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pixelated, bit to pixelated, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, they're very small, so they're very pixelated. So these are examples of C510 images. And, okay, so this I example. Think the, 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 uh, yeah, go ahead, Shambhavi, go ahead. Oh, okay. uh, there's another question. Yeah. Uh, don't you think your model takes too long to converge 50 versus 200 epoch? Priyanshu asks this. Uh, it takes a while. Uh, let's look at the time. I think we have time measure. Uh, do we have the time, uh, Saipra? I'm not uh, time sure. No. Priyanshu, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Priyanshu. Uh, I think there's a time. Yeah, so it takes around. So the normal classifier takes around 60 seconds. The, the normal classifier, uh, like the classifier only without the augmentation, as you can see here, it takes around 60 seconds per epoch. Uh, ours takes around double. Oh. So yeah, it takes double. Uh, okay, but that's the time per epoch. But I guess the question was, the number of epochs is too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, let's look at the plot again. Yes, yeah, so uh, for the uh, classifier only, it converges around epoch 60, right? So there you can safely say an hours converges more at like 120. Yeah, so that takes double as well. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can, maybe I can give a yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. argument. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, we didn't, we didn't really play with the, with the scheduler. So I think we can, we could reduce the number of epochs by uh, tweaking, tweaking the, the scheduler, and uh, the problem is also when when uh, you publish paper, you have to compare to other to our papers, and so in some cases we had to to take the same parameters as the others to to be fair in the comparison. Good, 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 good. Priyanshu, I think go ahead, please unmute yourself. Yeah, please yeah, go. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so, like, how hi. did you decide this uh, epoch parameter, like? Uh, because after 50, uh, when we see a normal training, then it isn't trying to converge and it's like trying forever for like 150, 160. 
Uh, I think the question is the spikes, uh, Isam, yeah. and it takes uh, like you see that at 175 it kinds of uh, flattens out. Is that the question, Priyanshu? Yeah, like uh, how did you like decide this? Because uh, if you see the resident or like uh, the normal classifier, it goes uh, to a good level at 50, but uh, you're still seeing spikes after 50 also. So. Mm -hmm. Why does it, uh, Isam, basically, why does it go crazy all the way? That's, I think, that's the question. Yeah, like uh, how did you like uh, decide this factor of uh, going ahead with this uh, method? And was there any logic? Yeah. Ah, I mean, so I, so I think uh, two hundred was the first arbitrary number, right, Cypra? Yeah, I think. Um, so this is on the test set. So we do early stopping on the validation set. So. Uh, we just waited for it to converge on the validation set. And then mm. we tested that set. Okay. Does this answer okay, your I'm... question, Priyanshu? Yeah, yeah. If I can reformulate, yeah. is, is your question, how do you define the scheduler? So how do you define when to change the learning rate and so on? Uh, no, no, no. I think it's more like, how do you know the number of epochs? Yeah, like that. Is that right, Priyanshu? Yeah, like like how did you decide that uh, number of epochs? Because yeah. on a normal uh, like training, we uh, we stop at after some time because at hundred also it's not converging. So we try for different methods, but uh, yeah, like yeah, why didn't you give up? Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isa, did you just, yeah. Huh? I think did you just uh, let it run its course, or uh, that's what Priyanshu is asking. Did you just uh, let it run its course until it flattened out, or uh, was there any logical uh, yeah. steps that you followed to determine the number of epochs? I think that is the question. Yeah, For me, I just cross my fingers and it works okay. after a while. <laughs> but uh, okay. Pipra, did more experiments. Pipra did more experiments than me. Okay. Uh, I might have more informed uh, decision why. Good, good, good. Yeah, we yeah, just. Yeah. We uh, yeah, Priyan should do one thing, collect your thoughts and put uh, more details in the chat. Let uh, Isam go through the yeah, code yeah, sure. and we'll come back again. Yeah, we'll sure, sure. Q&A session, we'll come back. Sure, sure. Yeah. Please collect your thoughts and put it in the chat. It will be more uh, helpful. Sure, okay. sure. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay. Please go ahead, Isam. Uh, sure. Okay. So let's say we want to train the classifier only. So the classifier only is only the blue region without the green. And then we have time to crop. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Yeah, we care about the code. <laughs> okay, so the idea here, so we define that A, like the argumentary to be none. We get the experiment dictionary, like the config high parameters. And this is how to get the model. So just to get model, which is in the repo, get model, the high parameter. Uh, we need to feed the train set because it defines the number of classes and so on. And then let's say here, we just define the number of iterations to be 100. And then what we do in the loop here, Let's see, yeah, let's hope it works. Okay, so here is training. So what, it, what we do in the loop here is that every time we, uh, we get the batch, uh, this is PyTorch, by the way. So we get the batch from, uh, by indexing the training set, the PyTorch data set. And then in the model, we have net C, uh, which is the classifier. And then we have a function called train on batch. So we have a function called train on batch. You just give it the batch, it returns the loss and it updates. So train on batch contains um, zeroing the gradients of the optimizer, computing the classification loss, which is the cross entropy, and then uh, progressing the uh, optimizer. Uh, yeah, so that's that, That's how we train the classifier only. Uh, something I didn't show is the architecture. So the model has two uh, networks, right? Net C and Net A. So Net C, this is Net C. So, okay, we're using data parallel, it's important. Uh, for ImageNet, but what we use is the meta meta formulation of the convolution, the batch norm. This is resident 18, so all of this is resident 18. Uh, we wrap it with the meta uh, torch meta uh, layers because it's required for for this part. You see here the the part where you go to the where you freeze the weight and you go to the validation loss and go back. Uh, uh, you have to do the meta learning uh, approach here, otherwise it will not. Work. Um, and then this is called the classifier. And then the augmenter is actually a very simple model. Ah, 
I know why. <laughs> okay, okay. Good. This is argumentative. So the argumentative is a very simple model. Uh, it's called small affine, and it just consists of linear, ReLU, dropout, linear, and dropout, and linear. And the idea here is, and, and the output is six. So why is the output, uh, the only output six numbers? So why is the output six? It's because we're using the spatial transformer network, uh, or we're using the affine transform matrix. So the affine transform matrix contains of two by three matrix, and then you apply that on the image, and that does an affine transformation on your, uh, uh, on your uh, image. So you can see a limitation here. So one limitation is that you, we are restricted to affine transforms. So an interesting future work is to do more than affine. So maybe do some kind of GANs or something where you have more freedom than just affine. Good, uh, good. Yeah, so this is just affine transformations. So the make, so affine transformations were done already by what is called spatial transformer networks. So the contribution here is this meta-learning part like the bi-level part, using the validation laws to update the augmentation network. So that's the, what makes this different from uh, the usual augmentation network. So this is how you train a classifier. Um, can we move this part? Yeah, you should give details about your machine that you're using later on. It's incredibly fast. Ah, it's just fast because uh, it's CIFAR 10. <laughs> With ImageNet, we will be staying here until the night. <laughs> uh, and this is the class uh, testing the classifier. So let's test the classifier. So what do we do here? We always define the experiment dictionary, uh, the high parameters, not A. Uh, let's print it. All right, let's click. Uh, so here's the path where we saved the data set, where we saved uh, the model, like when we were running the experiment, this is the path. And for every experiment, we have a folder uh, that is based on the experiment ID. So we see here, uh, this one, uh, I need to do something better here. Oh, the line numbers. Yeah, so line six uh, gets the experiment ID by hashing the high parameters. And then the hash defines the folder name for that experiment. Yeah. Inside okay. that folder, uh, you have all the information, the checkpoints, the results, and so on. Okay. So this is where we load the model. Yeah, so from, uh, so saved here is where the model is. So this is the base of where all the experiments are. Saved here is joining saved here base with the experiment ID, and then we load the best model. And this uh, does the testing. So this is for this experiment. Where, this is without the augmentation network, so we will get around 90%. This is without, uh, so this is the, and the test set on the CFAR 10. Uh, okay, so now let's add the uh, augmentation network. So like we did before, this is the augmentation network. So now I'm going to show training and testing with the augmentation network. Uh, let's, sh let's show some augmentations with the augmenter, like trivial ones. Okay, so this is CFAR 10, and this is some of the augmentations. This is original augmentation, original augmentation. So these are just some um, at some state in the optimization. So this Got one it. original, and this is like, you can see some, so, yeah. Um, Understood. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now how do we train with the augmentation network? So there's slight, some, uh, some slight difference. So remember with, so this is the same thing. So first we get the model, right? And then we have to, what we need to do is, so net A, model the net A is the augmentation network. And what we need to feed it, we need to feed it. Okay, here we did the test loader, but we need to feed it the validation set. Here we're, Got here it. we're cheating it, but uh, I just put the test loader. We feed the test loader because that's what the augmentation network is testing on. The test loader. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So you give it there, uh, that. And then this is the loop. So you get the train batch. And then what you need to do, you need to train the uh, network, the augmentation network on the batch using the model network C, where it gets frozen. So here, uh, this is the shared weight part. So this one gets frozen. So there are two losses here. So here, compute uh, augmenter loss. 
and then here compute authentication loss and then you add them together and then it should just work so you see the losses go crazy like somebody they go yeah yeah this is oh, where the, okay. why they're also okay. Okay. so that could help a lot in deciding uh uh how many epochs to choose because the logs uh the loss will vary a lot and then when it stabilizes mm -hmm. that gives us an indication that it's converging um yeah i think Priyan, sure. I think this answers your question. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Priyan, sure. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, Yeah, so we can use the last to uh, see uh, when we should stop. Like. Okay. Good, good, good. Very good. Very interesting, Isha. Uh, yeah. Uh, now we can test with the augmentation network. So. Uh, we just define the high parameters, you know, xdec like we did before, load the best model, and then we just test, and then that gets around like 94%. You don't see part 10 there. So. Okay, so this is by training and testing on uh, at small scale. But let's see when mm -hmm. we run them on large scale. So we, we have like a lot of high parameters, like we usually run like mm -hmm. hundreds of experiments. So what we can do is that, so remember, xdec is the experiment high parameters. But let's say we want to run for both the one with augmentation network calls none and then one with augmentation mm -hmm. network this small of time. So we can define a list of experiments. Mm -hmm. And let's say we have only mm -hmm. two experiments here. So, okay. so if, if we view them, this is experiment one, this whole thing. Mm -hmm. it calls none, this is experiment two, and that's A. And then if we want to run them sequentially, we just have to call this function called train val. Okay. Trainval, uh, it's actually in the code. So this is trainval on pi. Uh, and then you, uh, you, so you, we're looping over the experiments. We put the high parameter, uh, the experiment uh, dictionary, which is the high parameter. And there are two uh, parameters. I think there are always two main parameters in experiments. Yeah, yeah. First one is where do you save the results? Okay. So this is where the result is saved. Good, good. The results by level of man, let's say. And this is where the data sets are. Okay, okay. You feed these two and then it just uh, does a training loss. Um, and then it will uh, give like nice output. So while this is training, um, I can explain, uh, okay, so this is, um, so we, we don't have to do this from Jupyter. So this is, uh, I just made it, being done from Jupyter, but another way of doing this is that, so if you clone a bi-level augment GitHub, you can run them sequentially okay. from the terminal by just running okay. Python train file, uh, minus E CFAR, so this is all the, oops, all the experiments in CFAR. Like okay. this could be okay. 10 or 20. Okay. This is where you want to mm -hmm. save the results, and this is where the data is. Minus R1 is, yeah. uh, you do them, uh, you reset the experiment. Oh, good, good, just so one line, yeah, yeah. 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 So if, we do that, if we want to change the classification model, yeah. what, can we, what shall we do? Ah, I like that question. Um, if we want to change the classification model, so, the, so this get expedict uh, encapsulates a lot of things. So I just did it because there's a lot of code here. So this yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let's just put it there. Uh, this is a question because the idea is to be able to play with uh, a lot of experiments. So this is, let's say this is your expect, right? So this is net A, and let's say it's none, but here's the classification model, net C, right? So we can uh, put 0 0.2, 0 0.3, momentum 0 0.5, so we can change the model here the way you want. We can change the name, so we have other types of meta models so like this, and then you just feed that. Then you define that as your expedict, and then you put it here. So train val the expedict, and that and that will run it for that for this uh, high plan in here. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Answer your question, Shambhavi. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you.
I am definitely Good. going to play around with my own custom data set for image classification using this. So rather than just using the command line tool, if we can uh, make yeah, changes yeah. also, it could be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. So, uh, so this is where the changes can happen. So we have this file called xconfigs. Okay. So xconfigs contains all the experiment configurations. Like, this is for CIFAR. So here's doing Cartesian product between different high parameters. So let's say you have another data set, let's say called Bach, uh, and then uh, you can just define it. So you can define it here, and that's it. So you just define the name. Zoom in a bit, zoom in a bit. So you can define, let's say, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank so let's say your new data set is called Bach, so you define it here, right? And then, uh, and you put a name for it. Let's say we also name it Bach. And then what you do in the channel is minus E back, and it will run that high parameter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Thanks. Uh, and uh, but let's say this data set does not exist. So what you do is that oh. you go to this SRC. There's data sets. Okay. And then in the init, there's this get data set get data set function. And here okay. you just find the data set name. Back and then as back. Okay. As back. And then it should just return as a PyTorch data set. So as long as it returns as a PyTorch data set, that's it. So if you add another data set, you just add another block like this, of if name equals equals like your data set. If it returns, and then that's it, it will work with that data set. Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, and then yeah, you get the output. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Does that answer the question, uh, yes, Shambhal? Yes, sir. OK. OK. OK, thank you. Please go ahead, Isham. Very good. Thank you. I'm not trying to stop this. Uh, no problem. Let it run. We have one more question. Uh, Chinmay, you can check it in the chat. Oh, very detailed question. Chinmay, uh, unmute yourself and go ahead, please. Can you unmute yourself? Hello? Yes, Hi. Chinmay. Hi. Hi, um, I wanted to ask whether the generated augmented image, it is a blend of, uh, you know, various affine transformation or it is a, you know, uh, the generated image is a single transformation. Say, for example, if I have a, a image of a cat, then, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, after, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the augmented image which is generated is a combination of, uh, you know, maybe rotation or shifting or scaling or it is a sim uh, single transformation, say, only rotation or only uh, shifting. Yeah. Ah, good uh, you want to answer? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go okay. ahead. Yeah, actually, it's uh, as Isam explained. So the the model is uh, outputting a matrix of two by three, that are the parameters of the affine, and it's including all the affine transformation. So at the end, it would be a combination of uh, rotation, shift, and scale, and everything included in the group of uh, affine. And uh, if you add also on top the color transformation, it will be a combination of a fine transformation, so geometric transformation and colors. Yeah. Does it answer your question, Chinmay? Do you have yeah, any yeah. follow-up? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's always yeah, a combination. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is somebody saying something? Uh, no, no. Please go ahead with the question. Uh, Okay, so yeah, I wanted to know if you did an analysis of the output values of the trained augmented network. So maybe you can take those average values after the forward pass on the whole data set and use those values as the transformation parameters with the standard networks. Ah, like uh... Yeah, so it won't be as good as yours because it won't be adaptive to each image, but it would be interesting to see how good is compared to just using the usual transformations that we apply. Uh, okay, so you mean do the augmentations like uh, manually and then take the average, like like the uh, average? No, just, yeah. Just train by level optim, uh, just by level end to end, yeah. and then just take the internet network and analyze the average, uh, analyze the values that it gives for the transformation parameters. Ah, uh, and we can. Yeah, uh, and we can take the average of those values and use those with, let's say, standard ResNet 50 on ResNet and see how good that is as compared to the 
usual uh, transformations that we apply. I think I understand the question. For example, so what you're saying is, did we try to train till the end and then to extract the augmenter and take the transformation that the trained augmenter would give us to apply to a normal to a normal classifier, right? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, there's something that uh, is not clear in the title, but the, the learning is online. Um, maybe to, to help. Isam, can you go back to the, to the plot of the training? Ah, sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, maybe, okay. Maybe this is not the, the best plot, but uh, yeah. So basically what we are doing is that we are training online. So the augmenter is outputting uh, the best transformation for the epoch that is being trained. So at the beginning, and what we saw is that at the beginning it will be strong, but at the end, the more the training is advanced, the closer the transformation will be to identity. And so the problem is if you extract, so by doing the end-to-end -end training, it would help the, the training. But if you extract the classifier at the end and give images as input, you will get very small transformation that will be close to identity. And so if you take only the augmenter, well, only at the end and use the transformation that the augmenter will give you, the transformation will be close to identity and won't help if you retrain a model from scratch with the, with the, with the transformations. Himanshu, does okay. that answer your question? Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I got it. I just want to know, like, do you have any intuition about why it's behaving that way? Why is learning identity better once the model is trained? Um, identity is the best. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. Cypress, collect your thought. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. This is an interesting question that we try to, to, to answer. For the moment, we don't have the, the perfect answer, but there are other papers that are uh, investigating how that augmentation is helping the training. Like I remember a paper from uh, Stefano Suato, uh, where they, they, they saw that augmentation is helping a lot at the beginning. But uh, the more advanced the training is, the, the less the augmentation is helping. So if you for example, they show that if you uh, disable the augmentation at the beginning, it would be, it would uh, have a, a big impact on the, on the final accuracy. But if you disable the, that augmentation in the middle or at the end of the training, it won't have uh, uh, as much consequences. So they show that the, the augmentation is helping a lot at the beginning. So this is also what we saw in our model. So when the model is training, and we see it here in the in the uh, evolution of the of the loss, so the, the augmentations that are learned, so that are the best for the for the model, are very strong at the beginning. So it's it's varying a lot because it's trying to find a better optimal point. But the more trained the the model, the the less strong the the augmentation. Good Why good. I'm not sure. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. We also in contact with other researchers, but more from the mathematical point. So they are trying to, to find exactly why, but uh, it's still not very clear. So empirically, we see that the, that augmentation is helping and more at the beginning, but the why is still an open, an open topic. Good, good, good. So thank you. Looking thank for a topic oh, here for a PhD or something. Yeah, <laughs> you can try this. Yeah, yeah. You want to stick yeah. around? Yeah. I think uh, Isam, uh, are we done with the coding? Yeah, we can finish that and then take some more questions, maybe. Uh, very close. But yeah, just yeah. that extra thing about this is that what I realize in deep learning is that the more you crazy you go at the beginning, the better the generalization performance at the end. <laughs> is it uh, because it got a robust while training? To the exactly. different kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's like you make it robust. It's like a regularization thing. Yeah. Right. Good, good, good. That's, why, that's why there's a lot of papers, you know, that shows where at the beginning you start with a very high learning rate and then you start decreasing. Because you want the model just to go crazy. Got it, got then, it. Uh, until it stabilizes flat surfaces. And then 
you decrease the learning rate so that it converges properly. So uh, you went on uh, increasing the learning rate from a lower level to higher level. Uh, no, I, I meant uh, other papers uh, okay. usually start with a very high learning rate. Uh, like there's a technique, like you start with a high learning rate, make them all go crazy, and then you start decreasing the learning rate. We didn't do that here. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. But that's uh, like in my other optimization projects. We did this. Um, yeah, so this last thing. So this is the sequential form terminal, right? Like Python train val, you define the experiment group where you want to save SB is, you want to save the results here. D is where you want to save the data. But we also have another thing where if you want to run the experiments all in parallel. So good thing in Element AI, we have this thing called uh, it's, it's a cluster called the orchestrator. And uh, we often allow, like when we have external collaborators, we allow users to use our cluster. And by that, my, when you add minus J1 in your terminal, in the command, then it will run all those experiments that you defined in parallel. So this, uh, this is our cluster called the orchestrator, and then, it, and then it loads all the models, and then it runs all the experiments in parallel using this minus J1. So this is part of the uh, repo. Uh, right now, it only runs with the orchestrator cluster, which is closed source with Element AI. But if we have external collaborators, we can always like give uh, resources for that. Uh, but I'm also hoping to incorporate Slurm because Slurm, uh, I think, it's open source and allows people to use, like, for example, different resources with Slurm to uh, launch experiments in parallel, or uh, Amazon or uh, web services. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, so just to show you the dashboard again, when, if you launch them in parallel, then you can look at the jobs that have succeeded, uh, whether they failed, and so on. Then you can also. Visualization, yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, uh, that's it, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So heaven can be used with PyTorch? Uh, PyTorch, yeah. Good. It's all Python. Uh, yeah, Gunika, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, we'll take a few quick questions. We already, yeah, please, please, yeah. The question yeah. is um, I wanted to ask how does it handle the limitations of the medical images augmentations that you talked about earlier? Uh, like, how does it? Uh... Yeah, how does it understand which augmentation, uh, like transformation, is the perfect one to choose? Uh, okay, so oops, wrong. Uh, I'll, I'll give a quick answer, then Cypress can give a more detailed answer. Um, so when you have the training set, you divide into, you also divide that into a smaller training set and a validation set, right? So you use the validation, so you, you never train the classifier directly on the validation set. But the goal is to have high validation score. So you're training the augmenter to augment your image in such a way that the classifier will indirectly do well on the validation set. So that's like an indirect signal. So if uh, Guneka is focusing more on medical image data set, like she's asking how is it particularly helpful in the medical field as uh, Cypra shared in his presentation? Uh, why? Um, yeah. Gunika, you can follow up. Uh, please follow up. What yeah, yeah. Uh, what Shambhavi said is perfectly like encapsulates what I was asking. But is the question is like, is the question is uh, is the question why does it yeah. work well? Uh, no, one first, well? like uh, you talked about the limitations of augmentation that we don't really know which augmentation is the best one to use on medical images. So, yeah. uh, like, did you? particularly work upon that in your model and does it like handle those limitations as well and how uh, yeah, yeah, maybe i can i can give an yeah, answer yeah, on that please go ahead Sayapra. okay so the medical world is a bit difficult um so when you usually with natural images so when you do that augmentation you know more or less the augmentation that you are allowed to do like rotation scale and so on but for the medical imaging, it's a bit more tricky because if you don't have uh, medical medical knowledge, you don't know what is allowed and what is uh, biologically plausible. Like, for example, if you take 
some some scan of organs and you do some rotation, maybe the way the organs are then organized is not correct. And so usually what people are doing in this case is that they, they ask a doctor, uh, medical doctor to, to, to give some, some knowledge like, okay, what can we do with this kind of images? Can we do rotations? Can we do, uh, can we do flipping? Can we change the colors? And with this information, you train the model. And the problem is that you don't always have uh, access to a medical doctor. So it's a bit difficult to get this model. And uh, so you need something to uh, automatically select the, select the transformation. And uh, with our method, what we do is that we get a kind of signal which transformation is good based on the validation accuracy. So it's not replacing the expect knowledge, but we can get a sense of what could help the classifier to be better trained. Maybe, uh, Gunika, you can give some context to us so that uh, we, uh, Saipra can answer better. Like, what are you trying no, to uh, do? Like, sir, Saipra has already answered it very well. So basically, Gunika, uh, to summarize, it would be that, no, it is not about solving a specific medical problem, but this uh, model can be generalized for any any problem which requires domain expertise and uh, the domain expertise is not available to us. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Himanshu, you can go ahead now. We can take a few quick questions before we wrap up. Himanshu? Yeah, my, my question was answered. So yeah, you. I, I, you can give some background. You can give some. Uh, you can tell about yourself to Cypher and Isam so that they know your background. What are you trying to do? Uh, so I'm a master student at Mila. And <clears throat> yeah, I, I was just curious about that approach. So your, yeah, your neighbor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We can invite I'm you for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good, 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 good. Very good. Hey, you, all your colleagues are very supportive. Nice. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, when people are trying to ask more questions, you can tell us about Element AI. Sam, many people are asking what is happening, what is the research problem you're trying to solve in Element AI. Ah, sure. So, uh, Element AI is. Uh, uh, focuses on uh, solving problems with AI. So like creating products, uh, creating AI products and so on. Um, so this is one of the main goals is creating AI products for different clients. But uh, we're not really in the product team, we are in the research lab. So the research lab can uh, allow us to uh, to research on uh, stuff related that Element AI is doing in, the, in terms of products. So, right, for example, we're doing co computer vision, and the idea in, in our lab is we're trying to address research problems that are related to uh, weekly supervised learning, let's say active learning, free shot learning, and active learning, free shot, and, and weak supervision, like incomplete labels. Uh, this arguably might fall under learning with less data. So this is our research is how to learn well with less data. So this is uh, like, this is our lab. Basically. Good, good, good. So there's one, there's more, question. A, one yeah. more question. Uh, yeah. Can we use this on uh, video data as well? Like uh, splitting it into frames and then using it on the video data? I, uh, yes, you can use it on the video data, but it will not uh, consider temporal information of the video. Right. Right. Uh, this might help. Yeah. Anurag, I hope it answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank I you had one much. more question, but not related to the talk particularly. Mm. Um, do you think that uh, with the coming advances of automated tools to generate augmented images as well as uh, do labeling and everything, still there will be a need to uh, pursue research and a PhD in this domain to excel? Major. Like uh, the scope of data scientist has been changing. Earlier, people used to have a PhD to become a data scientist. Now, undergraduate oh. <laughs> students are also joining yeah. colleges. Yes, yeah. this is a loaded, loaded question. Nuclear. Uh, <laughs> question. Yeah. Isam just defended recently, uh, so he can answer. Well, congratulations, <laughs> congratulations, Ibra. Congrats. 
<laughs> now all the undergrads have papers as well. And yeah, now yeah, yeah. it's going to be high school students having papers and then... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, then newborns will have start having papers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and before, like you said, before we're like doing new classifiers and so on, now we're doing new meta classifiers. And maybe after that, meta, meta classifiers. Yeah. Like learning to learn kind of methods. Right. Yeah, yeah, the scope is changing a lot, but we're still very in a very limited regime. So this is a very this is classification regime. It was extremely painful to make it work for ImageNet. Um, as you can see, the training was not stable at all. Uh, it's limited to affine transformations. So there's still a huge research uh, thing to do. You know, like and these augmentations are like like affine, like super. They're not, they're simple. They're not like other types of transformations, like I'm hoping for augmentations, like different backgrounds, different regions, different, like also augmenting different objects in the image instead of the whole image. So there's a lot of things to do here. So the classification is like the easiest task. So there's still segmentation, counting, uh, detect object detection, then becomes a whole world of pain. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, uh, I have one question. What were the other comments for this paper? Any significant comments that you can remember on top of your head? Uh, author? Uh, the reviewer comments, sorry, sorry. The reviewer comments for this reviewer. paper. Yeah, yeah. Any significant question that you can remember for this paper? Yeah, so we submitted uh, one of the, the main questions is that when we submitted last time was that we didn't have ImageNet results. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to do ImageNet. It just takes two weeks and requires a lot of engineering. Mm -hmm. We add that, so that, that was their main concern. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think the main concern were about the transfer to real life. Like, uh, what is the time overhead? Uh, is it applicable to big data sets? Is it applicable to big images? Yeah. Oh. So, so that's why we pushed to have it. Uh, experiments on ImageNet and oh, with VAC because VAC the images are like 2000 by 1000 so it's quite big oh, okay, okay, okay. compared to Cypher 10 for example yeah. okay. and uh, yeah so using variable optimization um, introduce a bit of overhead for the time but it's worth it for the for the final accuracy so it's helping it takes a bit more time but it's helping yeah, good, good. Stampavi, do you have any more question from the audience? Uh, uh, just one more question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do we expect it to be uh, used as a data augmentation library integrated with PyTorch anytime soon in future? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> let's, let's let's see. <laughs> I good, can good, tell good. you why. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just that meta learning is not mature yet uh, in terms of uh, engineering, like coding. So if you go, oh, okay. let's say, to, so in order, so it's not like just adding in one line of code and it, it will work, the bi-level optimization. You have to change your whole model with meta. So all, all your layers have to be converted to the touch meta layers. So that requires a lot of changes in your code, right? Yes, yes, understood, understood. So uh, having to change all those parts in the code, uh, making sure that the validation flow, and also creating the graph to flow from the validation loss to the model is also not very straightforward. So all of that engineering uh, makes it a bit difficult to make it like a default. I'm hoping at some point where we will able to just do like one line, like enable by level, and then it just works. But the current form, uh, we're still far from that engineering-wise. Uh, it's very challenging. Once, when someone comes up with a library, or maybe when someone comes up with a library that allows us to like seamlessly do meta learning, then uh, it can be integrated by default in Python. Good. good, good. I think this oh, is also. Uh, yeah, yeah. One more. Uh, heaven can be used to visualize any of the classification models or any models at all. Ah, uh, so completely uh, any, anything, uh, uh, everything. So you can visualize anything you want. Okay. 
it's not uh, it's not restricted to uh, uh, a classification like Haven just requires you to have uh, a pickle file with scores like a score mm -hmm. list a Python uh, score list and the checkpoint you just have you need those two and that's it it will visualize it will do everything very good, very we have good. a lot of uh, projects based on the Haven like this framework that doesn't have to do with classification very good, very good. I think uh, yeah we, uh, we can wrap up uh, thank you Isam and Saipra uh, this, was, uh, this whole, thing, whole thing was brought to by student volunteers uh, then um, uh, Shamba, we can introduce herself because this entire thing was initiated by a student. Shamba, you can just introduce yourself. No, yeah, I'm just, an, as I said, I'm an undergrad, undergrad student and looking forward to research. For me, this is a learning experience. I get to know how the researchers think and uh, that is why I initiated this thing to encourage people to still take up research in AI and not just uh, depend on uh, Automated tools, auto ML tools. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. That's the idea have, of to give you the all the, the flexibility to do your own experiments and configuration. Right. Good, good. We have Swarup as well. Please, uh, Swarup, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. Hello. I'm Jyoti Swarup. Uh, I'm an undergraduate as well. Uh, I've uh, recently started uh, looking towards research, and yeah. I've recently been associated with Shampavi and uh, Chenmay Jaisar. So yeah, this helped me a lot. Like this was my first talk or a live experience which I've attended with a research paper. And of course, reading a research paper and understanding it in a first glance is tough. And uh, this experience has really helped me understand the paper better. Yes. That's awesome. And Thank you, Isam. Thank you, Saipra. We have one final okay, question. Yeah, Chinmay, please go ahead. We won't keep them waiting. Chinmay, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. Fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, did you try using training loss uh, to update the augmentation network parameters? Or, you know, uh, I'm, I, I wanted to ask whether, uh, you know, using training loss to update uh, uh, augmentation network parameters would be any good because I think you you, you have used validation loss to uh, to update the augmentation network parameters, right? Um, yeah. So if I correct me if I'm wrong, but that would be exactly like spatial transformer network, right? Yeah, this was what I was going to answer. So basically, yeah, if you uh, use the training loss to train the the augmenter. Uh, it will be like the special transformer network and you learn something different. So you won't learn the documentation, but you will learn the invariances that are already in the data set. So you will basically learn to uh, align the, the images. So you can do that, but you will learn something a bit different. Okay. It should learn the identity, right? <laughs> So I believe uh, the initial spikes uh, in the graph that way because um, uh, the I mean you augment I mean you updated the augmentation network parameter only once after the epoch right I mean uh, during the validation phase. Uh, so, I think it's uh, no I think they're together right Saipa? This every yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's every iteration. Uh, if you look at the example here, so this is. Yeah, we do. We do the uh, the update for each mini batch. So we do one forward pass, and then okay. with the training set, and then one uh, backward pass to get uh, the loss and uh, the gradient with the validation, and we update the validation. Yeah. So if you look at line eleven to two to twenty two, uh, this is one iteration. Okay. So we okay. compute the loss based on the validation. This is the loss, the commenter loss based on the validation. Mm -hmm. And this is training loss, and we add them together, and that's it. Like you, you get update. Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chinmay. Yeah, I think you can wrap up. Thank you, Sam and Saipra. Thank you yes. for starting off with this uh, initiative. Next week we have a transaction of a pattern analysis and machine intelligence paper. If you are interested, uh -huh. you can attend. Yeah, yeah, because. Uh, Transactions are never presented. They just are uh, published. So yes. we are bringing a mix of both conference as well as transaction paper. Uh, we'll circulate the details in our Twitter. If interesting, 
please uh, attend and thank you thank you very much for answering all the question uh, thank you for your time isam and saipra a pleasure yeah. congrats saipra for uh, the defense oh no no it was isam <laughs> it was isam who defended <laughs> oh okay i still i still need a couple of years to finish <laughs> just starting <laughs> okay this good good isam thank you for your time thank you for answering all the question and uh, uh, thank you for the participants for all the question so i think yeah. we can wrap up thank you very much thank, thank you. you very much have a nice day yeah you too have a nice day have a nice night yeah yeah have a night that's right <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah thank you yeah we'll end the meeting now